Last time we talked about community ecology and life strategies of populations, different defining growth curves of those populations, limits to population growth, as well as how to characterize diversity in a community, landscape patterns, and the resilience of communities to disturbance. Today, we're gonna to talk about one population in particular, the human population. So first, I'm gonna introduce this graph. There's a lot going on in this graph. There's a lot of data. So I'll just break it down for you. Here along the x-axis, we have year from 1960 to 2010. On the primary y-axis, we have growth in percent or children in number. So going from zero to seven. And then on the secondary y-axis, we have the gross domestic product that is in US dollars per capita going from zero up to 12,000 here. So there's a lot of information. All of this information is focused on a case study of the Brazilian population. And this is a case study that should bring us a lot of hope and set an example for how we should uh, emulate our population dynamics across the globe. So in Brazil, a mix of economic growth, female empowerment, urbanization, and the widespread popularity of television and the images it portrays of modern life have resulted in one of the most abrupt declines in birth rate over the past decades in any country in the world. So here we can see going from 1960 to 2010, we see an overall increase in the GDP per capita as represented by these bars here. Coinciding with that increase in GDP for the country, we see corresponding with this, the children per woman outlined in red steeply declined as well as a decrease in the population growth outlined in orange here. So swift economic progress brought about dramatically improved standards of living in this country. And in 1960, the average wage in Brazil was less than 2000 US dollars per year. And only 19% of Brazilian households had electricity, which means TV was rare, also, the average education for females was only two years. Coinciding with that, at this time, the average number of children per woman was 6.2. Okay, so we could see that 50 years later, the average wage has increased dramatically. It has risen fivefold in that short amount of time. And 95% of the households both had electricity and television. The average education for females, instead of only being two years, skyrocketed to almost nine years, which is actually a year more than males in this population. So the growth rate during that time also decreased to less than 1% here. Along with this, infant mortality has fallen from 204 per 1,000 children in 1960 to about 19 per 1,000 today. So knowing that your children are more likely to survive to adulthood makes a big difference in how many children you choose to have and how you choose to live. So during this time where we have the rapid economic growth, this was spurred about through rapid industrialization and urbanization as people moved from rural areas to city centers in search of jobs. And currently about 87% of Brazilians live in these urban areas where they decide to have smaller families and have an economic advantage because of that. There was recently a program that was instituted to extend electricity to those remote rural areas and to the, the slums or tent cities in the hills around major cities. 
So as people moved to the city, they had more access to TV. They also had more leisure time. Daytime soap operas offered a view of modern life and the modern world. And they were followed avidly by the population in which actors and plots and situations and the telenovas were widely discussed and admired in the public. So in general, these programs, these television programs had a huge influence on how Brazilians chose to live their lives and strove to have smaller, more affluent lifestyles in a modern society. Importantly, in these telenovas, women in particular were shown to be powerful executives and business owners who have successful careers of their own making and a lot of personal freedom. So this image really changed the aspirations for many women. The desire to have a large family wasn't so prevalent. Um, it wasn't as prevalent as perhaps their, the desire in their grandmother's generation or even their mother's generation. So what's to note here is that there was no official government policy in Brazil to mandate this change or to promote family planning. This was all done on the individual level, ex exercising their right to choose what type of family they wanted to have and make use of birth control that was available. What's to note is that if we take a look at the worldwide population, population increases worldwide are pretty recent as we discussed several lectures ago. Human populations began to increase rapidly after the year 1600. And we can see that here, taking a look at this graph, where again, we have year denoted on the X axis. And on the Y axis, we have estimated population in thousands and we could see we really started to precipitously take off in our population size in the late 1700s here. We only reached a billion at that time. So going from this 1 billion to the nearly 7 billion that we see now, it only took 150 more years to attain that precipitous growth. So it only took about 12 years to add the seventh billion to our planet. The living number of humans tripled during the 20th century. The question is now, are we going to see a similar increase in the 21st century? Or as we can learn from community ecology and life strategies, are we going to reach an equilibrium soon enough and at a size that can be sustained over a long period of time. So putting this population growth into a historical context, we can look at human populations throughout history and understand where the population was at the agricultural revolution, pretty low. Again, ancient Egyptians, the Roman Empire, all really at this low rate of population growth, which kept us under 1 billion on the planet. You can see this dip here, which represents the time in which the bubonic plague plagued the, the world's population. And it was only until the industrial revolution where we see the skyrocket in human population. So we can take a look at this in another way and look at doubling times. This table represents the world population growth and doubling times throughout different periods of history here. And we can see population numbers drastically increasing and notice that there's a change in the doubling time here. And the doubling time is just how long it took to get from uh, one population size to a doubled number of that population size. So from this data, we can see that it took fewer and fewer years to double our population size. Now that does change when we get to estimates of 2050 where it is predicted to increase. So since the industrial revolution, individuals have argued about the causes and consequences of population growth. The big question is does the environment or culture control population growth. One of the uh, strongest voices in this argument was Thomas Malthus. 
Thomas Malthus argued in his essay, Principle of Population, that human populations would outstrip their food supply and collapse into starvation, crime, and misery. In other words, if you keep growing the population, eventually you're going to reach a point in which there's no longer any food or shelter or resources to support that population. He defined this as the point of crisis. And you can see that outlined here with the blue line showing exponential growth for the human population, meeting the linear growth in our resources. The point at which we exceed our resources is defined as the point of crisis. There was someone else who also put forth arguments about human population and causes, and this was Karl Marx. He actually presented an opposing view that the population growth resulted from poverty, resource depletion, pollution, and other social ills. So he actually had a, a completely different frame of reference for why human populations grow so rapidly. He was a very vocal opponent of the Thomas Malthus argument. He wrote against Malthus frequently and characterized the Malthusian idea as a direct attack on the poor, justifying continued exploitation and repression with no regard for those disadvantaged populations. Carrying capacity, according to Marx, is determined by the social material conditions of a given time. And we have the ability to affect the threshold of sustainability depending upon our access to resources and the social class in which we inhabit. Different social classes have different carrying capacities, according to Marx, and therefore, it's the existing class divisions that drive these different carrying capacities. This can be summed up in this video that does a really nice job of explaining it. Thomas Robert Malthus was a British scholar who was well known for his population theory. He demonstrated that the rate at which population grows is exponential, whereas the rate of growth for food production is linear, suggesting that at a certain point in time, humanity will experience a massive agricultural crisis due to overpopulation. Furthermore, overpopulation will create poverty as an increase in the number of poor people will reduce wages for the working class. For Malthus, the problem could mostly be resolved by cutting aid for the poor, who he blamed as the cause of the population crisis and the reason for growing poverty. Malthus argued that propping up the poor would only serve to make the population and poverty problems worse. Only indirect population control through strict austerity could save the world from the inevitability of the crisis Malthus envisioned. You may think that many of Malthus's points have been disproven over time, and that his general argument no longer holds ground in modern discourse. To some extent, that is true, but many of the arguments that depend on a theory of overpopulation still draw from Malthus's central point, that population itself is at the center of global agricultural and ecological crises. If you've ever heard the argument that overpopulation is driving climate change or resource scarcity, you're probably familiar with some strain of neo-Malthusianism. Many Marxists fundamentally disagree with this narrative. Actually, Marx and Engels themselves wrote against the theories of Malthus. The Malthusian argument lends itself to being an overt attack on the poor, justifying continued exploitation and repression, with no regard for the need of the disadvantaged, who, even in the most benign of Malthusian presentations, are seen as a burden to the rest of society. According to Marx and Engels, carrying capacity, or the maximum ecologically sustainable size of a given population, is actually determined for humans by the social material conditions of a given time. Humans possess the ability to change the environment around them in such a way as to affect the threshold of sustainable population. Marx and Engels argue that different social and economic organizations have had different carrying capacities. This is pretty clearly observable across time, with the advent of capitalism actually being a major point of expansion in human carrying capacity. If you look at the difference in population between pre- and post-industrial societies, you can see that our carrying capacity is very much a factor of our own social and economic structures. It's not that we do not have the resources to clothe, house, and feed the world's population. It's that the existing class divisions do not allow for such an objective to be obtained. According to a number of sources, there is enough food to feed everyone on the planet today and in the coming decades. According to some sources, the annual food waste alone could feed up to 2.5 billion people. What's more, while some believe that we are set to grow until the 22nd century, others claim that increasing urbanization and access to education will cause humanity to peak out at around 8 billion people 
somewhere in the middle of this century. So if population growth is slowing, and by most accounts, we have enough food to feed up to 10 billion people, what's stopping us? Marxists would say that it's all about economic paradigms. The market system is simply not built to factor in waste or distribution based on need. Markets distribute based on a commodity exchange, which from the end of the consumer normally comes in the form of money to product transactions. Don't have the money to buy food? Sorry, nothing personal, but that's not the market's problem. Similarly, the market does not know what to do with food that isn't being bought. Since it cannot be sold and thus no profit can be made off of it, it is often discarded because it has no economic utility. Similarly, some products are discarded outright before they reach a point of exchange simply because they do not meet an aesthetic quota and are therefore not likely to be bought by consumers. So if we are to make sense of why we aren't feeding those 2.5 billion people with our waste, the concise answer is, there's no money in that. Let's set the record straight. Most Marxists may very well agree that our current demographic trajectory is not sustainable. The Marxists support certain policies put forward by Malthusians, such as family planning, women's rights and autonomy, lifestyle changes, etc. However, Marxists value those goals and policies as components of a greater emancipatory project, especially for women in the case of reproductive rights, and not as a part of a vision of large-scale population control. In essence, the Marxist lens refuses to accept the exclusive blame Malthusian arguments place on the people. The Malthusian perspective rests on the assumption that population is the common denominator for resource problems, and subsequently ecological problems as well. What we are left with is a convenient omission of the responsibility of the ruling class and the capitalist mode of production as the driving mechanisms for resource problems. Marxists stress that issues of scarcity are a function of class society, and not a natural constant as we would be expected to believe by Malthusians. Naturalizing contemporary issues is a very convenient tactic that quite clearly plays out in the favor of the ruling class. In perpetuating this perspective, the elite can present the most severe of concerns as inescapable and not as a function of their policies. It is, of course, very much in the interest of the ruling class to support the lifestyle change argument, and in extreme cases, population control. Such solutions don't put into question capitalism and demand sacrifices from the general public to offset problems that are largely fueled by mechanisms of the market. So that presents the Marxian lens of the population growth dynamics in society. In other words, yes, we do as individuals have some uh, ownership over climate change and personal decisions that we can make to mitigate the effects of climate change. However, oftentimes culture and society places us in a position that doesn't allow us the freedom to make stronger choices. For example, uh, electric cars, those are pretty pricey, right? And so if you were at the dealership and you had a budget, well, that electric car, even though it is more sustainable and green, for you, you are in the constraint of your personal budget, and therefore you choose to use a gas consuming vehicle. So we are most definitely a product of our society and our environment. There's a YouTube video for you to watch on the tartan, which also explains the different components of population growth, very com clearly explained by Bozeman Science. So I do want you to watch this video as well. So in the video that we just watched, they invoke the term carrying capacity. So we need to ask, well, what is the carrying capacity for humans? There are a couple of estimates. John Cohen at Rockefeller University reviewed published estimates of maximum human population size that the planet can sustain. And through these studies, he estimated that our carrying capacity as a planet is roughly 10 to 12 billion. David Pimental from Cornell University states, that by 2100, if current trends continue, 12 billion miserable humans will suffer a difficult life on Earth. Okay, so that's a, a pretty drastic view and prognostication, but it all stems from uh, the data and our understanding of carrying capacity in an ecological and our understanding of carrying capacity in an ecological framework. There are different estimates. So for example, here in 2020, we're at 7.8 billion. Future estimates range on the high side for 15.6 billion or on the low side, seeing a dip to 7.3 billion by the year 2100. 
So from this, we need to calculate the impact of human population on Earth to the environment. And the population size is just one variable when we're making this calculation. What kinds of resources we use and how we use them is another variable. And we can sum up our impact in this mathematical formula, I equals P times A times T. And what these terms mean are the following. Our environmental impacts I are the product of our population size P times affluence level A and the technology level T. Affluence level simply refers to the lifestyle that you live. So for example, a family living an affluent lifestyle in the US could cause a greater environmental impact and greater environmental damage than a whole village of African hunters and gatherers, just because the sheer amount of resources that that affluent lifestyle requires. Coinciding with this is the ecological footprint of human populations. And we can also likewise calculate the impact of our ecological footprint. It all comes down to consumption choices, the amount of land required to produce goods and services. So for example, a meat-based diet requires more land and more water resources than a plant-based diet. These are all consumption choices that we can make. The ecological footprint is the estimate of the relative amount of productive land required to support each of us. Forests and grasslands, they have these ecological services that they provide to nature, like storing carbon, protecting watersheds, purifying our water, and providing habitat for wildlife. But through our consumption choices, we divert those benefits that are provided by nature to enrich ourselves at the expense of other natural processes that benefit from their services, like protecting watersheds and purifying water. So now let's talk about a different term called demography, specifically human demography. This is defined as births, deaths, where humans live, and the total population size. We see a map here countries by birth rate in 2014 with the cooler colors meaning lower birth rates and warmer colors meaning higher birth rates. We can take a look at the global distribution of this birth rate data and see that some of the largest birth rates are occurring in Africa and some in Eastern Europe and Asia. So some factors affecting this population growth is fertility, number one. This varies among different cultures and different times. Mortality offsets births. So if you have a high mortality rate, the number of births to replace those people dying has to increase if you're going to keep that uh, population growth steady. All entwined in this is that life expectancy is rising worldwide through the advent of modern medicine and waste treatment and removal. And living longer has profound social implications. Throughout your lifetime, you require resources, as we just mentioned. And if you live longer, the amount of resources that you require to sustain your life is going to increase. So taking a look at this first concept, fertility, fertility is influenced by culture and the total fertility rate is defined as the number of children born to an average woman in a population during her reproductive lifetime. This varies according to many factors, cultures being one of them, access to education being another, but globally, this fertility rate is on the decline. But the rate of decrease in that fertility rate depends on what type of country you're looking at. So more developed countries in blue, they have an already low fertility rate that seems to be stabilizing. Least developed countries, they started off at a higher reproductive rate or fertility rate 
looking back from 1950 through today, they have this steep decline here. So all of these trends point to a worldwide decline in fertility rate. It takes several generations of replacement level fertility to reach what is called zero population growth or ZPG. We can represent the ZPG by births plus immigration. So people coming to your country, this combined should equal deaths plus emigration, people leaving your country. And if this is satisfied, both of these equaling each other, then you've attained zero population growth. The replacement level fertility is roughly two children from two parents. But where infant mortality rates are high, the replacement might actually be closer to five children per couple. Um, that's not really a trouble in highly developed countries where the rate is usually about two. And this is because some people are infertile. Uh, some people have children who do not survive to adulthood. And some people simply choose not to have children. So fertility rates have declined dramatically in most regions over the world during the course of the past 50 years. And while the world as a whole still has an average fertility rate of 2.6, growth rates are now lower than any time after World War II. Um, so we can take a look at this graph here again with the x-axis representing year and the average number of children per woman on the y-axis. We see in the United States, we saw a boom here uh, after World War II, also in Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. But after that boom, we see this precipitous decline. Another thing that affects the human demographics on our planet is life expectancy. Life expectancy is rising worldwide. And this is directly related to the lifespan, which is the oldest age to which a species is known to survive. And the life expectancy is the average age that a newborn infant can expect to attain in any given society. We could take a look at the life expectancy across the world's largest countries throughout the years. Here we have 2010 and then projected for 2050. And the largest population in millions in 2010 is China, followed by India, and then the United States. And this life expectancy is directly related to income. So as incomes rise, so does life expectancy up to about $4,000. And so here we have annual per capita gross national product represented in thousands of US dollars. And you can see some of the highest life expectancies are some of the richest countries here. Above that level of 4,000 US dollars, that curve really levels off. And some countries like Russia and South Africa have far lower life expectancies than their GDP really would suggest. Jordan, on the other hand, right here, has only one tenth per capita GDP of the United States over here, and yet it has a higher life expectancy. So we see that there is a benefit in uh, increasing wages and income uh, to life expectancy, but it really plateaus off. We can plot in a different way the human demographics of each country with what we call an age class histogram or an age pyramid. This lets you know um, how the population is spread out, both male and female, and then their reproductive class. So here in the purple at the bottom are the pre-reproductive populations. And then we have the reproductive class in pink, followed by the post-reproductive class in yellow. You'll notice here we have life, uh, age, 0 to 5, 6 to 10 years, 11 to 15, and 16 to 20. So this age range represents the pre-reproductive class. 
And then from the ages of 20 up through 50, we define those individuals as reproductive class because they are of reproductive age. Beyond that time, we classify those individuals as post-reproductive. So the shape of each of these age pyramids is distinctive for a population that is rapidly growing, one that is stable, or one that is on the decline. These bars here represent the percentage of the country's population in these consecutive age classes. So a population, an example of a population that is rapidly growing is Niger because most of the population are either in the reproductive class, so able to produce children right now, or soon will be in the coming years. There are not many in that post-reproductive class. A population that is stable, according to this age pyramid, is Sweden. We see an equal distribution across these different reproductive classes between pre-reproductive, reproductive, reproductive, and then post-reproductive. And then finally, a population that is predicted to be in decline based on the age pyramid is Singapore. And that's because most of the population either is in the reproductive class right now or is in the post-reproductive class. Meaning in the next few years, there won't be that many reproducing individuals in the population just based off the distribution of the pre-reproductive class here. We can project the shift based on demographics in a population. What's wild is that by the mid 21st century, children under 15 will make up a smaller percentage of the world's population than those who are 65 or older, just based on those age pyramid demographic data and projections. So here we have a year on the x-axis going from 1975 through 2150, percent of the world population on the y-axis, you can clearly see that those under the age of 18 will rapidly decline as their percent in the world population, while we see an increase in the number, in the percentage of those who are 65 or older.